What's the matter? It doesn't work. Why not? It doesn't make sense. Sure it does. No. Where's the problem? The, the problem is you are crazy. Well, what difference does that make? You admit it. You, you just told me that you are. So? You said a crazy person would never admit that. Yeah, but it's... Oh. <laughs> I see. So? It's a point. So how can you admit it? Well, because I'm also dead. Order, I don't have to work here. I could take some stuff home, read it, bring it back. No. I'll be careful. My father wouldn't want anything moved, and I don't want anything to leave this house. Then I should work here. I'll stay out of the way. You're wasting your time. Someone needs to go through your dad's papers. There's nothing up there. It's garbage. There are 103 notebooks. I've looked at those. It's gibberish. Someone should read them. He was crazy. Yeah, but he wrote them. How are you? OK. How are you feeling about everything? About everything? About dad. What about him? How are you feeling about his death? Are you all right? Yes, I am. Honestly? Yes. I think in some ways it was the right time, if there's ever a right time. Do you know what you want to do now? No. Do you want to stay here? I don't know. Do you want to go back to school? I haven't thought about it. Well, there's a lot to think about. How do you feel? Physically, great. Except my hair seems kind of unhealthy. I wish there was something I could do about that. Yes, this is something I want to do. Come on, let's do some work together. I can't do it out here. It's freezing cold. I'm taking you in. Not until we talk about the proof. No. God damn it, Catherine! Open the goddamn book and read me the lines! I don't think I should spend another winter here. There's nothing wrong with you. I think I'm like my dad. I think you are too. I'm afraid I'm like my dad. You're not him. Maybe I will be. Maybe. Maybe you'll be better. Hello, welcome back, everybody, and um, thanks for uh, for being here. And thanks again to our fantastic cast for that uh, inspired, inspired reading. Things. So you did some actual improvising on stage as an actor. I know you wrote sketches, etc., for for sort of comedic uh, company that was a sort of successor to, to Second City in a way. Were well, you an I, improviser uh, as well? I did. I I mean. This, the Compass Players, which was the progenitor to the Second City that Mike Nichols and Elaine May had started, had, that had started in Hyde Park, this neighborhood where, the, where I went to school. And there was one of the people who had been behind that had come back and started another group that was meant to sort of keep that tradition alive. And I was a part of this group that did it. And so I did improvisation and written sketch comedy as well. But even, I think, more more than that, there was a there was a tradition of sort of do-it-yourself theater, that kind of Steppenwolf model where you get together with a bunch of friends and you get a space and it's a grubby space, but you, and you keep your day job. It's not, you know, you're, you're not running off to join the circuits. It's part of your daily life. And you put on theater at night and you get your friends to come and you do it, you do it at whatever level you can and you, you slowly build an audience and a reputation. You teach yourself how to do it. And that, that model was was the thing, I think, more than anything else that I got from living there. I had several friends who were kind of older than I was and had gone on to do that and formed small companies. So when I, when I was leaving school with the idea of trying to do some kind of writing for the theater, that was a really wonderful model to have in my mind, that you, know, you didn't need to go to graduate school and you didn't need to go and join, you didn't need to be good enough to join you know, a giant established regional theater or a Broadway theater in New York. You could, you could build it yourself. Mm. And what about in terms of the craft, um, writing those sketches and, and being involved in the improvisation community? Are there things that you took from the sort of that crucible um, of needing to produce at that rate or in front of an audience, et cetera, that you were then able to take into the sort of more studied process of crafting a play? Yes, I mean, very much so. I think there's a, there's a lack of pressure that comes from doing that kind of work that I still feel is very valuable. You know, you can, Either a joke is funny and people laugh at it, or they don't. Or, or to, e either the premise of, of of a small sketch is clear to the audience and they can follow where it's going with pleasure, or they can't. And if they can't, you can tell yourself that you're a great artist and you're just working over their heads. But that's that's, <laughs> you know, there, there's a limit to how long you can sustain that. So, so um, doing that kind of work forces you to get serious about 
your craft and understanding why certain choices you make have certain results uh, in front of an audience. Right. Let's talk about, uh, uh, so you then you, you you'd made an initial jaunt to Hollywood, correct? It was the isolation of being a screenwriter is, it's, 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 it's depressing, but it's also not productive particularly. And you know, th that's the incredible thing about doing theater is that you can do it at any level. You know, you can, you can do a show for your friends in a basement that has as strong an, uh, you know, an artistic impact on them as any play in any theater anywhere. And, and that's not, you know, so it's scalable and that's not true of the movies certainly. And then you ended up at Juilliard uh, f doing some playwriting yeah. studies and playwriting, right? Well, Juilliard started a program. They, they had had playwrights around the acting program here and there, but they, they, they decided to be a little more systematic about it. So they, they began a program where four playwrights were there in residence for a year. And that program continues now, but I was in one of the very early years of that. And that was the first time that I'd ever had, I, I'd never really worked with trained actors. I never, I mean, I always worked with actors who were like me, you know, people who kind of made it up. So, I mean, that is to say, I've never worked with good actors. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so that was, I felt that my writing took a big step forward by virtue of having to learn about the process that actors, trained actors were going through and, and learning to anticipate the kinds of questions that they would ask when they, when they were dealing with the text. Mm. Um, uh, and thinking through, being able to think through the work from the performer's point of view really helped me, I think, become a better playwright. Are you conscious of those kinds of things, kind of actor processy things as you write? Yes. I mean, part of the reason proof gets done a lot is because the ages are good for actors. But I, you know, I think that the thing that I felt that I learned most at Juilliard that crystallized the most for me is that actors have to have answers to those questions of what am I doing now kind of thing. And that it's not that you, it's not that the first time you're working through the scene that that is present in your mind completely. You're, you have other things on your mind, but that as you revise it and think about it, you kind of continually check your choices against the possibilities that are there for the actors. And if, and you know, you find that if you're in rehearsal and the explanations you're giving to people about why they're saying the things they're saying or doing the things they're doing become verbose or complicated beyond a certain point, then the problem is not with them, you know, it's with you. Have you got any sort of masterly craft tips for finding ways to successfully motivate uh, exposition? I think it's pretty simple, and I feel like I learned this between between skyscraper and proof actually, because I think that there is clunky exposition in skyscraper, and I think that the the simple rule is just that you can get away with any amount of exposition as long as the character who is hearing it needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as as long as there's a real need for that information to be conveyed to the person on stage, and if you're just saying it so that you can put something out for the audience's benefit, mm. uh, you're not going to get away with it. Like or it's naming something you and I would both know. Right. right. It's like saying it out loud. Exactly. As you know, know, I am your brother. You know, yeah, that, that right. kind of thing right. is, is usually pretty hard to pull off. Yeah. 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 Good. There are always things that I look at and feel that I feel good about and satisfied with, and there are always things that I wish I could revise. And with a play, you could revise it, but it's, it's a dangerous, I think, uh, you know, body water to dip your toe into. Yeah, you. Do, I mean, you. You would not know when to stop, and I, I think it's. Um, you sort of have to just abandon it and let it be. But I always feel it's. It, I was saying earlier, it's like looking at an old photograph of yourself, and you know, you sort of say, "That all right? I looked okay, but God, why was I wearing that?" You know, th that that feeling of of um, of you, know, you. One has mixed feelings. Like, you know how you're feeling that you kind of suck and you're really, really not sure if this is a good idea that you're doing this and your parents are right that you shouldn't be doing this and you're wasting. Everybody feels that way. Everybody feels that way at every level of the profession to some degree or another.